So here we are. We're in week five. It's crazy. I prayed about this beginning of the year and laid everything out. And you're, you're like, oh, my gosh, you know, how are we going to get to the so long to the end of the year? And we're like, we just got one class left after this. And then we're going to take a break. Remember, after the series ends, we do a night of worship and usually pizza. And, and then, then we have another six-week series. It's called um, he- Healer, the Miracles of Jesus. And we're going to go through the six weeks of, of the healing miracles of Jesus. So that's going to be a really good good series. And I do, I, I really do. I pray that you guys have, have, have learned from this lesson, from this, from this series. And I know it's been a blessing for me. It really has. I, I learned so much with the research and, and just digging into Scripture. And it's, of course, it's a different way than I, than I like to teach on Sunday. Sunday's an expository style of teaching where we just go through books of the Bible line by line. And, and this is more thematic, and, and it gives me a chance to, to move around uh, the, the Scriptures. So, Let's get started. We're going to talk tonight. I want to recap. If you remember week one, we talked about who's the owner. And that's an easy answer is God. God owns everything. We're the managers. He trusts us with his resources. Week two, healthy stewards are blessed stewards. Healthy stewards are blessed stewards. Week three, Elder Joe took it, the principle of first. The principle of first fruit, first giving. Jesus was the first gift, the first offering, the first fruit that redeemed us. Your first fruit, your first giving, redeems the rest of your resources and expenditures. Last week was good stewards reject mammon and they accept God. Remember, mammon is an evil, is a demonic spirit of material wealth and greed. Good stewards reject mammon and they accept God. So tonight we're going to talk about healthy stewards pass the test. And I'm so excited because I love tests. So are you guys ready for a test? What test, right? I didn't know there was going to be a test tonight. Well, I will tell you, actually, we're being tested daily. We're always under the test. Be it uh, every time you get paid or maybe uh, some, receive some resources or provisions. Or maybe you, you move into a deeper anointing, a deeper revelation. Or the unlocking of a new a spiritual gift. You've always got the opportunity, or how are you going to steward that resource? You're always getting what I like to call the blessed tests. How are you going to steward the blessings that you've received? Like I said, whether it's, whether it's your paycheck, whether it's a bonus, whether it's a new spiritual gift or an anointing, how are you going to choose to pass that test? So, You say, you mentioned a test, and I'm like, I don't want to talk a lot about tests, but it's important because God is going to put you to the test tonight. The test actually comes from, like an old teacher, you know, I taught college for a while, he said, well, open your textbook. I guess now kids say, open your tablet or your, your iPhones, but the test is found in Malachi 3, 10 through 11. So let's read this test. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this. That's the test. Try me. The only word in Scripture where God says, try. Try me and see if I'm not good for my word. Says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. What I will tell you is is ties submitted to the Lord, is protected ties submitted to the Lord. The Lord will rebuke the devourer from attacking the rest of your resources. That first fruit, that first giving is the, is the redemption. It redeems the rest. So in Malachi, God issues a test. And he says, try me. Try my faithfulness to provide. You give your tithe and you test him. Now, you know, we always talk about this. This is week five. But, you know, I believe that the Western church has done such a terrible job teaching the body the reality 
of the tithe. It's got a negative connotation. Most people put their hand over their wallet or are like, mm, there they go again. And I get it. There's some crumb bums out there that have flat taken advantage of the body of Christ. But this is why we're going to stick to the word of the Lord. This is nobody's opinion. This is the gospel truth. So when God says in Malachi to test him, he's not kidding. He's not kidding. He's as serious about this as he's as serious as about his son Jesus, as serious as he is about do not murder. He didn't take his foot off the gas and all of a sudden, all of a sudden decided to play, play a trick on you. But it requires, he says, give your tithe and test him. You see, the world has put a negative connotation on the word tithe. Look, all it means is a tenth part. One-tenth. Like, we can exegete it, we can go into the Hebrew and the Greek, and you know what it's going to mean? Tenth. I wish I could dig something more interesting than that up for y'all. But it always means a tenth. Because that's what the word literally means. It can't be 3% or 7%. It literally means 10. So, what does the number 10 represent? Because there's always a reason. It wasn't just a coincidence. Because there are no coincidences in the kingdom. Throughout scripture, 10 represents testing. It represents testing. We actually see it over and over in many of the different ways. So, so this is part two of the test. So I'm going to ask, and you can answer it out loud or, or just kind of nod knowingly. But how many plagues were there in Egypt? There were 10. How many commandments are there? Well, there's 10. How many times did God test Israel in the wilderness? Yeah, there's 10. Like everybody should be feeling confident. And you know what? Even if you don't know the answer, you start looking for the patterns. How many times were Jacob's wages changed? 10. How many days was Daniel tested? 10. How many virgins were tested in Matthew 25? 10. How many days of testing are mentioned in Revelation? Ten. How many disciples are there? All right. <laughs> I've just tested. <laughs> I've been tested to make sure you're paying attention. I will tell you that our kids did not pass that test earlier as I'm going over the message. But I want to tell you, every one of these scenarios reflect testing for the people involved. You see it in Malachi 3, 10 through 11. We see it again. The tithe, the tenth part, the testing. But you know what God's testing? Not your bank balance. He's testing your heart. Where is your heart attached? Is it to your bank account or is it to the good book? Is it, is it to God? That's what he's testing. The only area where God says that you can test him. And in return, he promises you to bless you. It's like he's daring you. Like, put me to the test. Like, I was a punk in school. I was a little kid. I was a little, not a bully, but, I, you know, I like to agitate my siblings. Come on. Come on. Come on. And I'm testing. And the Lord is saying, test me. Let me bless you if you would only trust me. You see, the passage in Malachi is so simple. If I tithe, I'm blessed. There's no if, and, or but. He says, if you tithe, I will open the windows of heaven and pour out on you. But if you choose not to tithe, then you don't get the blessing. And this isn't compulsion or pressure. I'm just giving you the word of the Lord. If you feel like, oh, I'm feeling a little tight-chested, <laughs> let's call conviction from the Holy Spirit. There's no compulsion. God loves you. God gives you freedom of choice. you got free will. And like I say, choose wisely. But you got to know the rules. The kingdom of God is a kingdom. It is a governance system. There's laws. There's regulation. There's structure. You cannot run willy-nilly through the kingdom of God and expect to be blessed. And God doesn't want you running uh, chaotic and, and without 
Well, I don't even know what his will is. Have you asked him? Like, God, this is a whole instruction manual. And it's amazing when you open it and you read it. But you know what happens is we get into the law. People are still arguing about law versus grace. Law versus grace. You see, I hear it all the time, and I know y'all do too. And I got to tell you, I was delivered from this years ago. I said, well, you know, tithing's part of the law, and I'm not under the law, so I don't tithe. It's your choice. It was my choice back then. But the Lord delivered me from ignorance. You see, so is it okay? Is it okay for me to lie to you or steal from you? Or maybe, maybe covet your possessions? Is it okay for me to do that? Like, what if I reached in your pocket, Abraham, and I took your wallet and I walked away, and I go, hey, bro, I'm not under the law. It's okay. You see, that sounds foolish. And it is foolish. Because I will tell you, if it was wrong under the law, is it now right? It's not. And if it was right under the law, is it now wrong? No, it's not. The tithe is the tithe, and I will show you that the tithe began way before the law. But you see what Satan does? Satan uses what God meant to reveal our need for grace and Jesus' actual uh, the, the salvation. He used the law not for salvation, but for conviction to realize that we can never achieve that level of righteousness as the law required. It was meant to, to help us to see we need help. We need a Savior. We need your son, Jesus. That's what the law was meant for. But what does Satan do? He stirs the pot. He, so we can get all legalistic. We can all become like the Sanhedrin council. We can get a little pharisaical or like the Sadducees, or the Herodians, or this Sunday we're going to talk about the scribes. We like to whip the law when it benefits our personal opinions. But I'm going to tell you, this is not an issue to debate. I do not get in debates with people, well, we're not under the law no more. The law don't even exist. I'll tell you, Jesus gives you the answer in Matthew 5, 17. It says, Christ fulfills the law. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. You see, the law, whether it's about tithing or not murdering, it remains applicable. It remains in place. And you know, this should be encouragement. It should be encouragement to receive the words from the Old Testament and understand that they're still as relevant today as they were when they were first spoken. Because you see, God's word does not change. We get so used to this, to this demonic culture, everybody changes their mind. Those married, where do you want to go eat? I don't know. Wherever we leave the house and we're heading to is never the place that we wind up at. Always changing our mind. But you know what doesn't change? Hebrews 13, 8 tells you, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And it is the same Jesus Christ who told us, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. You see, every part of the word is vital to our well-being, including the parts about tithing, including the parts about tithing. So let me, so, so we can get locked into the, the, the Levitical laws. So let's go before the law. Let's go to Genesis 14, 18, 20. Then Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high. He was blessed and he blessed him and said, blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who, was the, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. And he, this is Abram, and he gave him a what? A tithe, a tenth of all. 
You see, there was no law. There was no compulsion. Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth of all. Now, it didn't end there. Abram, by this time Abraham, his grandson Jacob, who we know became Israel, the nation of Israel, carried on the principle of presenting 10% to God. Let's stay in Genesis 28, 20, 22. Then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me and keep me in this way that I am going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I have set as a pillar, shall be God's house. And all that, I give, and all that you give me, I will surely give a what? Tenth to you. A tenth, a tithe. This is Abraham's grandson. This is Jacob, who the names changed later because identity. The Lord gives him a new name, Israel. He is maintaining the principle of the tithe. There was no Levitical law. Let me tell you, Moses continues the tithe. In Deuteronomy 26.1-2, and it shall be when you come into the land which the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance. God is giving, providing, and you possess it and dwell it, dwell in it, that you shall take some of the first, first fruits of all the produce of the ground, which shall bring, which you shall bring from your land, and the Lord your God is giving you. Let me let me make this point. We talked about it the other day. It says, you shall bring from your land. It doesn't say you shall give to God. You cannot give back to God what God first gave you. Amen. I give you my car, you bring it back to me. It was always my car that I gave to you. So I want you to see these principles that have not changed. So, which you shall bring from your land that the Lord your God is giving you and put it in a basket and go to the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. I want you to look at that for just a bit. To go to the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. Now I will tell you that place at the time became the temple. In modern day, it is the place where God's name abides is the local church is the local church. The same principle as the temple where the people gathered. Where they came, they gathered, they taught, they sharpened iron, they worshiped the Lord, they offered sacrifice and praise. Nothing has changed since Deuteronomy, since this was first spoken. I will tell you that you are to bring the tenth, the tithe, your first fruits to the place where God chooses to abide. And that is the temple, now the local church. What I will tell you what it's not, it's not the government, it's not your credit card company, or your favorite sports team, or your hobby, or your designer coffee. Now you can have all that after your first fruits. Because you see that first fruit, that tenth, redeems the rest of your purchases. That first tenth keeps you or can help you from understanding, where'd my money go? Because look, money don't love you. Money's got no emotion. That money will walk out of your wallet as quick as you blink an eye. If you're operating in a natural understanding of wealth, if your focus is on accumulating worldly wealth, if you will trust the Lord, not because I said so, but because his word says so. If you will trust the Lord and giving him your first fruit. That, let's, I challenged you a couple weeks ago. Let's start with some easy first fruit. Your first words in the morning. Let your first words be, thank you, Jesus. Just start with that. Give the Lord your first in everything. Your first and best has got to be brought to God before anything else. Why? 
You see, Moses is instructing the people on how to live in the promised land. This is what Moses is doing at this time. They, they had been saved from the oppression of Egypt in the Exodus. And now they've wandered because they've been living in sin and rebellion. If it was nowadays, they'd be like, no, 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 I'm going I'm to, I'm you know, I'm going to pay my cable first. I'm going to go give me a little Starbucks. If I got a little change at the end of the day, I'm going to drop it in the basket when nobody's looking. This is what they were doing for 40 years. And the Lord was protecting them from moving into the land of promise that he'd given them. What Moses is doing is he's instructing them. Because the Lord told them, instruct them. Like, I want to bless my people. I want to open the windows of heaven, and I want you to be blessed beyond belief. So the rest of the world will know that you're my people. So Moses is teaching them how to live their best blessed life. And you see, you've got to learn the same thing. You've got to learn the same thing. If you're living under the radar, you've got the humdrums, and, and the ends never meet the means, or the means never meet the ends, and you're always a little behind. That's not the way God created things to be. But he can't bless you if you're not ready your nets. He can't bless you if you're not preparing yourselves. He can't bless you if you don't trust him to give to him first. He wants you to come into that land of promise. But you've got to learn to be a good steward of those things that he gives you. You see, tithing is not just Old Testament. Let's see what Jesus has to say. So we'll jump to Matthew uh, 23, 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Now, what I will tell you is people, that say, oh, 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 <laughs> well, first off, um, Matthew, at this point, we're still under the old covenant, right? We don't come into the new covenant until Jesus is crucified, resurrected, ascending. We have received the Holy Spirit and dwelling. So you can try to manipulate God's word any way you want. But what I'm telling you is this is what the Lord is telling the people And what he's telling them is, he's saying, you pay tithe, good job, but you neglect the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. He's not saying, look, you ain't got to give no tithe. Just be good to people. You got a good heart, you over there. You ain't got to pay no money. That's not what he's saying. You do tithe, good for you, but you neglect justice, mercy, and faith. And then to make sure that he, he puts the cap on and you don't think it's an easy way out of giving what the Lord said we got to give. He says, without leaving the others undone. The others undone is the tithe. Tithe attend to things like justice and mercy and faith. Do it all. Do it all. But I will tell you in this in this corrupted world, this chaotic world. And I'm not even going to say this demonic because it happens in the Christian church. We begin to, we're opposed to the idea of tithing because we want to distort this. Well, Jesus meant this and Jesus meant that. Well, I will tell you, simply read what Jesus says. If you've got a family Bible and, and, and it's sitting on a counter and it's big red letters and it's decorative and Go flip over to that scripture and see it's going to be in red letters. This is Jesus. This is Jesus saying these words. Like, do not miss the message because of a distorted perception, perspective on tithing. This is what the world wants to do. They want to create confusion. They want to create confusion. I hear it all the time, and I'm sure you do too. Well, you know, tithing's under the law. This is Lanyap. It's not in my notes. So if I don't get the percentages right, give me some grace. But I hear people say, well, that's under the law. And if we're going to give according to the law, well, it's not 10%. It's 23%. You see, because you had the, the Levitical tithe, 
and that was about 10%. And then you had the, the, the widows and orphans, you know, and that was like a, about a 10%. And then you had the festival tithe. That was about 3%. You only paid that every three years. And actually what you did was you kept that festival tithe for yourself so you could go to the festival. So they're like, if we're going to do real tithing, it's 23%. Praise Jesus. You want to tithe 23%? Give 23%. But what I want to tell you is you're not locked. This is not, the tithe is not a function of the law. I've given you examples thousands of years, 2,000 years before Christ, when, when, when Cain and Abel first gave the first to the Lord. What I'm challenging you is, if you do tithe, you know the blessings that you've received. If you don't tithe, there's no compulsion except for conviction from the word of the Lord. If you're willing to trust him, like he, he's like, you don't have to give all your money. Just test me. Like, te like your next paycheck, just take the first 10% and bring it to the house. And just see what's going to happen. Now, you don't do it for an ROI, a return on investment, but you're doing it to see where your heart is. Because you could be well-intentioned and go, yeah, I get paid on next Friday. I'm going to do it. And you get paid and you're like, nah, bro, I'm, I'm keeping this. <laughs> I'm keeping it. You know what? It ain't about the bank account. It's about where your heart is. It's whether or not you trust the Lord. God's not testing your money or your management ability. He's testing your heart. Jesus himself said to tithe. So if the Son of God says to tithe, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to tithe. And whether you do or not, it's your choice. I just encourage you to choose wisely. So uh, I want to talk about can versus cannot. Two of the most common testimonies about tithing, people who faithfully tithe, they say, God's blessed me and is still blessing me. And people who don't tithe, I would say more often than not, well, I can't afford to tithe. I get that. But you know what I will tell you? You cannot afford not to tithe. You cannot afford not to tithe. You see, the only supernatural release of God's abundant blessing is through the giving back to God that which he gave to you first. I pray with so many people. And they're like, I just, I'm waiting for a breakthrough. I'm waiting for a breakthrough. I just feel like, like God's blessings are just, they're just blocked up by something. Yeah, it's called disobedience. It's called the fact that you don't trust him. He's not an ATM. He's not an ATM. What I'm telling you is test him. Test him. But I will tell you the truth, because I lived in that world years ago. You cannot afford not to tithe. If you are looking for a breakthrough, a supernatural release of the abundance of God's blessings, you've got to give back first to him what he gave to you. You've got to operate in the principle of first, the principle of first fruit. It's grounded in scripture. It is not grounded in opinion or a church's finances or an annual goal. It is scripture. Go and read it yourself. This week I send out my teaching notes and, and, and an edited video. Like to these, what I'm sharing with you, I'm going to send to you. Read the scriptures. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you. See, tithing is an act of faith that breaks the bonds against your finances. You feel like you're in chains. You feel like you're in captivity. You feel like, like you should be further this way, but you're a little bit that way. You are bound you are bound spiritually because you've not broken those chains. You've not broken those chains through giving God your first fruit. Malachi says, God invites you to test him. Then do it. Then do it. So I just ask, consider. This is always about equipping and always about correction. We've all moved glory to glory through the process of sanctification. And this is a key sticking point that the devil has masterfully manipulated. Not to hurt the churches, 
but to hurt the body, to keep living in lack and want. Well, it's law. What I'm asking you to just consider, do you faithfully tithe? And if you do, have you been blessed by God through your tithing? And I'll ask, if you choose not to faithfully tithe, are your finances, are they healthy? Are they consistent? Are they multiplying? I taught through Matthew 25 a couple weeks ago. What is, what is faith? Faith is measured in what? Multiplication. Multiplication. If you're faithfully tithing, your resources and your blessings are multiplying. And I'll just give you an example. I'm going to be a good steward of time. But if, if you come up and I'm directing traffic and you want to go to the stadium and I say, well, yeah, yeah, uh, turn right and go to the stadium. And you turn right, you know where you're going to go? You're going to the stadium. But if you come up and, and you say, well, I'm going to turn left. You know where you're going to go? I don't know. But you're not going to the stadium. Like you might end up at a McDonald's in the play place. And you might decide you're at the stadium. And you might post on social media that you're at the stadium. But I will tell you, no matter what you tell yourself and other people, you're not at the stadium. Like God gives clear directions, clear instructions. This is a kingdom of order and rules and structure. You must follow directions. To get out of a poverty mindset and get into God's abundant provisions, you must follow follow directions. And like I always tell you, church, the choice is yours. I just pray that you choose wisely. The most important thing about stewardship is it gives you a chance to deepen your relationship with God. Remember, God owns everything, and he trusted you as the manager of it all. And like I said, every good business, the owner and the manager communicate and have a solid relationship. That communication by you as the manager of everything God owns is called prayer. It's called reading the, reading the business manual. It's not complicated. We mess it up. We don't want to follow the rules. Every decision is an opportunity to talk to God, to steward what he trusts you with, and build a relationship with him. I will tell you that blessed finances start with obedience to God. Y'all, there's no other way. There is no other way. Breaking the bonds that the world has against your money, against your blessings, against your provision, the only way to unlock that, the only supernatural transference is through obedience. So, if you will, I would like to pray a, a prayer for financial blessing. I like to be comfortable, which means it's a little long, but I prayed over this and I've written it. But what I do want you to do, if sit, and I want you to close your eyes, and if you would make a prophetic gesture of faith, open your hands, open your palms, lay them on your knees or wherever you want, with the expectation of of receiving the blessing, receiving an encounter with God, and just allow this prayer and these declarations to edify you. So, dear Lord, we come before you with a humble heart, seeking your divine intervention in our respective financial situations. You, Lord, are the source of all blessings, and we trust in your provision and care for us. Your word says that you supply all our needs according to your riches and glory by Jesus Christ. We know this because Philippians 4.19 tells us this. Lord, we ask for your wisdom to manage our finances wisely and for your guidance in making decisions that honor you. Help us to be a good steward of those resources. We pray for opportunities to increase our income and for your favor in our financial endeavors. We declare that we are blessed and highly favored. We believe that you are opening doors of opportunity and pouring out your blessings upon us. 
We trust in your promises and stand in faith, knowing that you are our provider and our source of abundance. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness and for hearing our prayer. We give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name. We pray, amen. And I want to declare, I will make this declaration for financial blessings. I declare that we are blessed and prosperous, that we are children of God, and He delights in our prosperity. We are walking in divine favor and financial abundance. The Lord is our shepherd, and we shall not want. We declare that we are debt-free and financially secure. We have more than enough to meet our needs and to be a blessing to others. We will be, we are cheerful givers, and we sow generously into the kingdom of God. As we give, it will be given back to us, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. We declare that we are wise with our finances and that we make decisions that align with God's will. We are disciplined and diligent, and we see the fruit of our labor. The Lord is opening the windows of heaven and pouring out blessings that we cannot contain. We declare that we are walking in God's favor and that his blessings are overtaking us. We are grateful for his provisions and trust in his unfailing love. In Jesus' name, we declare these things. May these words bring you comfort and encouragement as you seek God's blessing in your financial lives. In Jesus' name, amen.